Good evening. Welcome. My name is Cornell Morton. I serve as president of the Diversity Coalition, San Luis Obispo County. And we are very pleased to offer this program tonight, this dialogue, and so pleased that you're able to join us. On behalf of the entire board, uh, I want to thank you for your continued support, your continued participation, and we look forward to uh, programs that uh, you'll learn more about on our website as we move forward. Uh, tonight, we are celebrating Black History Month. Um, it's probably familiar uh, for many of you, the notion, the theme that associates, uh, associates itself with Black History Month because Black history uh, is in fact American history. We'll talk about that perhaps a little bit tonight and help you and all of us better understand how and in what ways Black History Month continues to be important in our country's life. Um, we talked a little bit about this issue, this program, the board did, uh, and we felt that given our uh, current social and uh, political climate in our country at this time, it was important uh, to pursue this program tonight to offer a conversation and a dialogue that we think will hopefully inform and maybe even inspire some of us to uh, continue to do the good work we're doing and those of us who are not quite engaged that it will inspire us to get more involved in this community across the vast array of diversity that um, exists in our state especially and in some ways even in our county. I won't go into great detail as I typically do about the coalition's history but um, some of you've heard me and others of us explained that the Diversity Coalition came into being back in March of 2011. Uh, it was in March of 2011 that a cross burning occurred in AG, Aurora Grande. A black family was victimized by that cross burning. And a number of people came together throughout the county to support the family. And in doing so, they decided to continue to meet, to continue to remain active. And in a nutshell, out of that, grassroots effort, community effort, grew the Diversity Coalition, San Luis Obispo County. Uh, tonight, our theme is a dialogue on triumphs and trials. And we have an outstanding panelist, panel, I'll introduce them shortly. And again, um, we're happy that you're with us. Just a very quick background or history around Black History Month. Again, some of you are familiar with this history, but I'll very quickly share with you. Black History Month is an annual celebration of achievements by African Americans and a time for recognizing the central role African Americans have played in American history. Uh, also known as Black History Month, the event grew out of Negro History Week, the brainchild of noted historian Carter G. Woodson and other prominent African Americans. Since about 1976, every US president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. Other countries around the world, including Canada and the United Kingdom, also devote a month to the celebration of Black history. The story of Black History Month begins in 1915 half a century after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. That September, the Harvard trained historian Carter G. Woodson and the prominent minister Jesse E. Moreland founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, an organization dedicated to researching and promoting achievements by black Americans and other peoples of African descent. Known today as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, the group sponsored a National Negro History Week in 1926, choosing the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. The event inspired schools and communities nationwide to organize local celebrations, establish history clubs, and host performances and lectures. In the decades that followed, mayors of cities across the country began issuing yearly proclamations recognizing Negro History Week. By the late 1960s, 
thanks in part to the civil rights movement and a growing awareness of black identity, Negro History Week had evolved into Black History Month, especially on many college campuses around the country. President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month in 1976, calling upon the public to quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history, unquote. So since 1976, uh, every Mer American president has designated February as Black History Month. And we have endorsed a theme or put forward a theme that we are titled Celebrating Black History Month, the dialogue on triumphs and trials. And this is a continuation of the coalition series on fostering understanding in our community. So again, welcome. Let me very quickly move now to introduce our panelists. I'm gonna begin with Dr. Camille O'Brien. Dr. Camille O'Brien is Associate Dean for Student Success, Welfare and Issues of Diversity and Inclusion in the College of Science and Mathematics and Professor of Kinesiology in the Department of Kinesiology and Public Health, <clears throat> excuse me, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Dr. O'Brien's areas of specialty include sociological and psychological aspects of sport, and physical activity, and her specific areas of interest are in social justice, gender, race, ethnicity issues in physical activity and sport. Dr. O'Brien has published articles and made a variety of scholarly presentations on how race, ethnicity, and gender impact socialization into sport-related careers. She earned a bachelor's degree in French studies at Smith College and a master's degree of exercise and sports studies at Smith College. After completing her doctoral degree in sport, leisure, and somatic studies at the Ohio State University, Dr. O'Brien served as a member of the sport and exercise studies faculty at the Ohio State University from 1995 until 1999. She has been a member of the faculty at Cal Poly since 1999 and has served in a variety of leadership roles in professional organizations in higher education. She was vice president for diversity of the National Association for Girls and Women in Sport. She's co-chair of the Social Justice and Cultural Diversity Committee. And she served as vice president for the National Association for Kinesiology and Physical Education in Higher Education, president from 2008 to 2010 for the Western Society for Physical Education of College Women and president from 2013 through 15 of the National Association for Kinesiology and Higher Education. Dr. O'Brien served as a director of the Alumni Association of Smith College, the board of directors from 2003 to 2006, and as a member of the Smith College Board of Trustees from 2015 through 19. Welcome, Dr. O'Brien. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Charles Bell. Dr. Bell's nearly 30, I'm sorry, I almost dated you there, Charles, nearly 13 year legal history or career. He has represented large private lending, I'm sorry, yeah, lending institutions and municipalities of all sizes. Most recently, he served as the assistant city attorney for the city of San Luis Obispo. And prior, he worked as chief deputy city attorney for the city of San Diego. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and minor in Ethnic Studies from Cal, from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. He received his Juris Doctorate from California Western School of Law in 2007. Immediately upon arriving in San Diego in 2004, Dr. Bell began establishing his roots in the community and he doesn't hesitate to let you know that he feels privileged to call San Diego County his home. Over the past 16 years, his unwavering commitment to community service has been recognized by numerous organizations. In 2016, California State, California Polytechnic State University, sometimes known as Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo's Alumni Association awarded Dr. Bell with its Distinguished Service Award. In 2017, California Western School of Law's Alumni Association awarded him with its Outstanding Community Service Award for his notable community, public, and humanitarian service. 
And in 2019, he received the San Diego County Bar Association's Service Award for service by a public attorney for his excellence in the practice of law with service to the community, the profession, the association, and legal education. Dr. Bell's commitment to community service demonstrates his ability to fulfill the city of national city's desire for a visible, approachable, community-centric city attorney representing its vibrant, socio-economically diverse community. Welcome, Dr. Bell. Dr. Patricia Rogers, Dr. Patricia Rogers Gordon, grew up in Arkansas in the 50s and 60s, where in defiance of Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court decision of 1954, declaring segregated public schools to be unconstitutional, African-Americans continued to live under conditions of racial separation. In 1965, her family migrated to South Central Los Angeles and Patricia, a first generation high school graduate, went on to earn her doctorate at USC, University of Southern California. She is a retired California State University administrator and adjunct professor and founder of Creative Solutions where she provided strategic performance training for corporations and nonprofits. Dr. Gordon continues to dedicate her time to mentoring first generation college students and fighting social injustice. She serves on the boards of several organizations that aid the economically disadvantaged, and she is active in a number of efforts dedicated to ensuring the civil rights of marginalized citizens worldwide. Dr. Gordon is currently working with the Equal Justice Initiative, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and the Sentencing Project to stop mass incarceration of African-American citizens. She holds close to her values and she holds close to a quote by Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Quote, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Dr. King, welcome, Dr. Gordon. Thank you. Dr. Joy M. Carter. Dr. Carter, the first black chief medical examiner appointed in the history of this nation was recently named as the first full-time forensic pathologist to the sheriff and coroner's office or division rather in San Luis Obispo County, California. Dr. Carter has served as the chief medical examiner for the District of Columbia, Harris County, that is Houston, Texas, Indianapolis, Indiana. And she was the first black female to serve as the deputy chief of the Armed Forces Medical Examiner Department and as a chief physician of the US Air Force in the field of forensic pathology. Dr. Carter was the first graduate of Howard University College of Medicine to become board certified in forensic pathology and has been triple board certified in anatomical, clinical, and forensic pathology throughout her career. Mm. Dr. Carter has always been an advocate for fairness in the criminal justice system and often has had to assume the role of single-handedly combating racism and gender bias while maintaining expertise and neutrality <clears throat> in death investigation systems. One of her many mantras has been never give up. Mm. And she continues to do just that. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> We're in for a treat. <clears throat> we are in for a treat. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. All of you, uh, we're so fortunate to have you with us tonight. And I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna turn it over to Kendra Paulding, my colleague on the board. And Kendra, thank you for your service and for your willingness to, excuse me, moderate this session. You got it. Hi there. <clears throat> So I would like to hear, hello, I would like to hear from Camille first, if you'd like to um, give your introduction, <laughs> that'd be great. Yes, yeah. yeah, sure. Thank you, Kendra. And thank you, Cornell. My gosh, listening to the introductions for everybody, 
Wow. This, made, this made me think how indeed it is an honor and privilege to be part of this panel this evening. I wanna thank the board of directors for the Diversity Coalition of San Luis Obispo for putting these programs together and inviting me to be a part of this community tonight. I really look forward to learning and hearing from other panelists and being in community with all who are present in this evening. Um, I will begin just, I know we don't have a lot of time and you know, Dr. Morton's already given you quite a lot of my background, but I wanna start with a little background of who I am, where I'm from and how it is I ended up in San Luis Obispo, California and as an associate dean. This wasn't in the rule book or the game plan. If you had asked me you know, when I was going into college what I wanted to be, the last thing I would have said was an associate dean in the College of Science and Math in San Luis Obispo, California of all places. And then I'm gonna finish with a spoken word that I wrote a few years ago uh, during a conference uh, session. And I use that spoken word a lot, to, sometimes just for myself, but also in my teaching and presentations I make uh, to help me sort of navigate those twists and turns and challenges. And um, I would say uh, difficulties that many of us face as persons who are from underrepresented groups in all these different careers. And, um, it still to this day helps me a lot in my own growth and journey. So storytelling also is a really important part of our legacy as Blacks people in the United States. Our oral histories are part of our strongest histories. And one thing I've learned in working with students over the years and myself and my peers is that the power in telling our story is a way for us to claim our social and cultural capital that is often kind of glossed over or eliminate it based on the fact that we're not, we don't even really know our history. Uh, and that's part of the, the overall plan and patterns around white supremacy. So I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts. And the more tired I get, the more you'll notice that based on how I talk. I'm a child of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and during my childhood, I definitely remember and experiencing a variety of triumphs and challenges uh, especially as I was old enough to be aware of what was going on during the Black Civil Rights Movement, uh, even though it was happening for decades and decades beforehand, but the late 60s, you know, things came to a head with the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Robert E. Kennedy. And although I was only seven years old, I, I will never forget watching Martin Luther King's funeral with my family. Um, we actually had three houses next door to each other all O'Brien's and we all got together and watched it together. Uh, despite those challenges, you know, in my own family and across my peer groups, I am always in awe of the strength and resilience and persistence of my um, kinfolk as it were. And that those periods and moments of strength and resilience and persistence are always greater than those moments of pain and frustration. So as I reflect on my childhood and even into my adulthood and professional life, I know I've been surrounded by an experience many firsts. Just hearing you know, Cornell's presentation of the panelists, you have also heard some of those firsts. My father and his twin brother, his identical twin brother, were the first black graduates to earn their master's in business administration from Northeastern University in 1964. If you're in those space of higher education or student affairs, you may have heard of or read about a man named John Donaldson O'Brien. That was my uncle John. He was the first black member elected to the Boston School Committee in the 20th century. Isn't it weird that prior to the 20th century, there were actually black Americans on the Boston Public School Committee, but you know, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson and Jim Crow kind of took care of all that. And it took another 75 years to get a black person elected to the school committee. It was my uncle John. He also served until the time of his death as vice president for student affairs at Northeastern University. Um, being and uh, growing up around him and his and my uh, father and my uncle, my other uncle, I was always amazed at how much they were engaged in community and coalition building throughout the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. Um, when we were younger kids, as soon as we were big enough to carry boxes and and move different uh, equipment back and forth. My Uncle John would rally us together to help him, you know, plan for and run a, a meal for raising money for the Black Educators Alliance of Massachusetts. It was the annual bean supper. So, you know, Boston and baked beans and hot dogs, it worked out for us. But from a young age, it wasn't just about, you know, carrying the hot dogs and the beans and 
serving the dinners. It was seeing people come together and building coalitions and communities to undo civil injustice, the social injustice. I was one of the first girls to join the boys club, well now the boys and girls club uh, in Roxbury, which is in Boston. And that was indeed, indeed thanks to Title IX. So in 1975, having a chance to join the boys club and join the swim team and you know, actually have a, a job, a part-time job after school were the beginning seeds of me moving into the career as I know it now. Uh, when I was in high school, um, or before I went to high school, the Boston Public Schools got this court order to desegregate uh, by a federal judge. And um, so from like 1974, 75, 76, through those years, I never had any black teachers until after busing, right? So it wasn't until I was in eighth grade that I had my first ever teacher that was black or African-American. It was my eighth grade uh, American history teacher and I'll never forget, he wanted to bring a unit of African-American history into an American history course, a class, you know, eighth grade American history class. And the parents raised holy, you know what, right? And even a lot of my classmates were just adamantly, I mean, we're eighth graders or 13, and they just were like, no way, I'm not going to read this, you can't make me. But Mr. Howard, he was from Richmond, Virginia, and he persisted. And we learned things. I never knew that the first person that died in the Boston massacre, which was the start of the Revolutionary War, was a black man. Growing up in the city of Boston, I had to learn about that after one of my teachers was brave enough to face that resistance and help me learn a little bit of history for my own city that was where I could be represented in that history. So thank you, Mr. Howard. I'll never forget you and your strength in that regard. I swam competitively from the age of 12 until I graduated high school. And then when I was in college, I actually joined the crew, the crew. so I was a rower in college. I went to a predominantly white private liberal arts college. And you know, throughout my experience of swimming and rowing, uh, and even in my formal education, I was, as my mother would often say, the only fly in the buttermilk. It was not uncommon for me as an athlete and coach in sports like swimming, rowing, synchronized swimming, to have other athletes, but more often the other coaches question my presence in those spaces. Did I really belong? Could I really swim? You know that age old stereotype that black people can't swim pretty strong back in the day and it still persists even to this day. And it was always so much fun to step, step on the starting blocks, stand up on the starting blocks and th those other athletes would think, oh, I got this, I got this. And I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, I got this too. And all the gold medals to show it. Um, I was undefeated for two years in my events as a, in high school. So I used to take great pleasure in swimming those races and shattering that stereotype. Uh, but my experiences with sports and an interest in education ultimately led me to pursue advanced degrees in exercise and sports. As I embarked on my doctoral journey, one of the first papers I researched and wrote in a graduate sports sociology class was focused on the lack of representation of black people in the professorate. Why weren't there more people like me? Right, I was really curious about that. And during that time, and I was doing that research for that paper, I learned that less than 2% of all doctorates in what was then referred to as physical education and kinesiology are held by black people. While that percentage has increased somewhat throughout the years, I can say with a reasonable amount of confidence that we still probably hover around the 5% mark of black people with their doctorates in physical education and kinesiology. And the number may increase slightly if I look at related disciplines like health and public health and um, health education and maybe physiology. But the point is that in the fields that I've chosen to pursue for my professional career, black Americans and their representation is relatively low. But my, my love for sports, my desire to figure out how indeed we could maybe learn more about why we can't get more folks like me involved, especially in leadership positions did ultimately lead to a job at Cal Poly. And in 1999, I joined the faculty in uh, kinesiology and I met a few challenges in that first year. I'm from Boston, like I said, moving further away from home, uh, 3,000 miles to be exact, in an age pre internet, really like we know it now, social media really didn't exist. I didn't even, I don't even think I had a cell phone then, quite honestly. I know my mother didn't have a cell phone. But she called me one day to let me know she had been diagnosed with cancer. 
And I'll never forget sitting on the steps of uh, Crandall Gym down by the uh, Spandau Stadium. And I just, I cried my eyes out. Like, why did I come so far from home when the love of my life, my mom, was facing such a serious diagnosis? Those, she did survive that surgery and everything and, and did live another 20 or so years before she we did lose her this past year, sadly. But, you know, I come from strong stuff. And so that was one challenge, right? Being the only black faculty member in my department in college is another challenge in terms of trying to find mentors and colleagues and folks who, you know, could be in community with me and help me learn and grow and have some space and respite. You know, Cornell, I'll uh, admit, he was one of my, my go-to places or spaces when I needed just to kind of be with somebody else who could understand and commiserate and support and mentor me. So I was very, I've been very blessed to have faculty colleagues like Cornell who helped me through those net difficult times because it was very common for me to have colleagues, mostly white men who would take great pride in making anything I said or did seem nonsensical and unwelcome. So, but with the amazing mentorship and support of my peers and the Black Faculty and Staff Association and some amazing allies like David Kahn, I was able to withstand those challenges and ultimately earned tenure in 2006 and was promoted to professor in 2011. So I'm not teaching right now because my current appointment as Associate Dean in the College of Science and Math has me spend quite a lot of time helping students navigate those same types of twists and turns and challenges that I experienced as an undergraduate and graduate student and many of our students um, experience now. Um, but I honestly say I definitely rely on those hard lessons I learned, the benefits of good mentoring and advising that I was able to have to help our students be successful, especially when they encounter those inevitable challenges that are part of their academic and personal journeys. About six years ago, I attended the annual national conference on race and ethnicity, sometimes we just call it INCOR, in American higher education. And I chose to attend one of the pre-conference workshops because I liked the session title and description. I found it really intriguing. The, I don't remember the exact title, but the idea was helping women of color connect with and celebrate this stealth legacy and in leadership and in institutional transformation. This workshop was designed to help women of color in the academy navigate the many hurdles and barriers, implicit and explicit, that we face while navigating those shifts and turns of individualized, institutionalized forms of racism, sexism, and many other isms that they relate to our, as they relate to our social and cultural identities. So I think of that workshop often, and I thought of it today, or not just today, but when I uh, was invited to be on this panel, uh, and when I thought about Black History Month. Too many times our voices, our vitality, our vibrancy, our beauty and power as black people are stripped away from us, sometimes from outside and even sometimes from within. So in that workshop, my peers and I, none of whom I'd ever met before, we had a chance to connect with each other, reconnect with ourselves and reclaim our social and cultural capital through a variety of exercises. One of the most poignant exercises was to create, for me, was the creation of a spoken word. Now, I've never written spoken word, I, and I not, don't consider myself a poet, a poet or creative writer, but I can honestly say that that exercise was an important pivotal turning point for me as I was embarking on my new roles as associate dean. So I'm going to share it with you now as I close my comments. And although it was a few years ago, 2015, so I guess it's like six years ago now, I, this spoken word still resonates with me today, and it still sustains me today, and I hope you find some things in it that resonate with you and your twists and turns and journeys and triumphs and trials and challenges uh, that you've experienced in your life. I am from Boston, Boston strong, from a beautiful extended family, multiple races, many faces, desegregated Boston public schools, crossing through the KKK and neo-Nazis because we all deserve an equal opportunity to receive a good education. I battle the complexities of intersectionality and white supremacist, patriarch, white supremacist patriarchy that courses through every layer of the institutions where I work, live, and play. I collide, growing and learning through collisions of differences. What? You're not white? But your last name is O'Brien. That's Irish, isn't it? The collision of an Irish name with brown skin 
has helped me learn many things about power and privilege. I defy when people told me black people cannot swim, yet my first job and entry into my profession of teaching and coaching came to me because of my work as a lifeguard and teaching swimming lessons. I encourage others to try, try to think beyond and within the boundaries they set for themselves and others set for them. Dialogue and change from across and within. I forgive myself for the mistakes I have made and others whose interactions with me have been intentionally and unintentionally disrespectful. I gain strength from the framing and experiencing the world through the gazes of social justice, inclusion, critical race theory, and critical feminist theory. I heart my family, blood and beyond, and my chances to help those with whom I am privileged to work, live, and play. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Charles, and uh, that was really powerful, Camille. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Charles. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Um, definitely hard to follow. Uh, when asked this evening by Dr. Morgan to participate in this panel, um, I really thought about one, um, the amazing relationship I have with Dr. Morgan and how it started similar to Dr. O'Brien on the campus of Cal Poly, and just be able to to find that, that safe place, that bond to be able to build with him um, and just be able to find guidance and a mentor. So before I go any further, I wanna thank him for his continued mentorship and guidance that I've received um, for so many years of my life and I look forward to many more years going forward. Um, when asked to speak about the topic, trials and triumphs, um, there's so many things that I could have touched upon um, that, that fall in the umbrella of law, um, which is often what I'm asked to speak about. Um, but what I really thought about is what is a trial and triumph and what is an aspect of law that I think touches us all um, that sometimes has really gone unspoken in the larger community, but recently has, shed been, has come into the light, I think, for many more of our society than um, those that were aware of it in the past. And for me, my trial is linked to my hair. Um, you really can't see it because I have it back up, but I've been growing my dreads now for 20 years, 21 years. It all started in 2000, at the beginning of my senior year of high school, when my mother embarked on her lock journey and invited me to join her on that path. Um, until that day, I always had short hair, short haircut. That was just the style. That was just my approach. That was just kind of um, the way I lived, lived my life with hairstyles up to then. But I decided to you know, join my mom on, on her, her journey into locks and uh, started that way. Um, but quickly, I found myself um, no longer uh, with the guidance of my mother or my loctician that I started with when I started Cal Poly in the fall of 2000. Um, needs to say, for those that know the Central Coast, know um, San Luis Obispo, um, I arrived in the Central Coast unable to find a loctician or someone else able to assist me with my hair on my journey. Um, and at that point, I found myself my own. And I really began learning to twist and take care of my locks on my own. It really became, how would I say, a labor of love that really taught me the investment in myself, an investment in something I started to take pride in. It's something that was really still a connection to my home, my mother, um, and, and something I was learning more as I dove into the history of locks and the history of, of African-Americans, the history of Africans and, and our hair. And, and so one of the first trials I found when I arrived at Cal Poly was one, learning how to do my hair myself. But two, as, as a member of the Cal Poly football team, being confronted with what is well known as hazing. One evening, um, getting ready to go into camp as a freshman, I can hear the sound of doors being knocked on and, and what sound like clippers and razors, um, clippers as you would hear at a barbershop um, coming down the hallway. And, and I immediately knew what was happening. Um, upperclassmen were going through and hazing the new freshmen by cutting their hair. And you can imagine terror and fear that, that took over me, knowing that something I had just invested in, something I took so much pride in, something that linked me to something I was so proud of was about to be taken away. Um, luckily, I was able to find a senior member of the team, plead my case, and made it past that first hurdle, that first trial, and, and went out along on my journey. Um, throughout my years at Cal Poly, I figured, you know, as I move out of San Luis Obispo to a larger, more, um, I would say more diverse community, 
such as the city of San Diego, where I arrived in the fall of 2004 to start law school, um, I wouldn't feel so alone and I would have more of an understanding in my community of my, my journey with my locks. However, finding myself being one of, and by the time I graduated, the only African-American in my law school class, um, I was once again found alone in my, in my journey with locks and, and the pride of my hair. And upon graduation, um, you know, I thought, okay, new chapter, something new is gonna happen, a new opportunity um, to now join a new workforce. Um, which might have a different approach. Um, but upon graduation, I was approached by one of the Black professors um, that had been a mentor for me throughout my entire law school journey. And she congratulated me on um, graduating. And, and she looked at me and said, so what are you gonna do now? And I spouted off about, I'm looking for this job. This is what I think I'm gonna land. This is what I hope to do. This is my career goals. She stopped me and said, no, no. What are you gonna do about your hair? And, and I looked at her and I was like, what do you mean? Um, and she kind of explained to me how now I was ending my educational um, time and things were gonna change. I was walking out into the professional arena and I would likely need to cut my hair in order to proceed on with my legal career. And I was really taken aback, but then I had to sit there and think about what she had experienced. Um, amazing um, African, um, African female attorney, amazing professor. I mean, hands down was the most brilliant one I've ever met uh, but then I remember when she started her career, it was in the 1980s in, in Chicago and the kind of um, discrimination, kind of prejudice, kind of pressure she felt um, working as a corporate lawyer at that time for um, a black woman wishing to, at that time, move up the corporate ladder, the kind of pressures and stereotypes and kind of um, pressures to assimilate to a corporate culture, which oftentimes was based on fine appearance. So I, I took her words, I took her advice, and I really understood where she was coming from, but I continued on, on, my, on my journey. Um, next thing I noticed is I went out and I started working for my, for my law school, and I was an admissions recruiter for the uh, law school and sent me all over America to so many college fairs for um, students interested in going to graduate school. I was excited because I was going to Orangeburg, South Carolina, and I was gonna be um, presenting at HBCUs. And I was so excited to be able to talk to the students about law school, a career, all these aspects that I was so excited to share with them. Um, but I wasn't prepared for the questions that I, was, I filled it that day. Um, set up my table, set up my, all my materials, was ready. And I would say 80% of the questions are, you could be a lawyer with hair like that. And, and, I, and I really enjoyed being able to talk to all the students and see the astonishment and, and see, see them really asking like, how did you make the decision to continue to grow your hair? Are you ever gonna cut it? Do you think you can really have a career? And have that open discussion about what was important to me, what were my values and why I continued along my journey. As, as I graduated from law school, um, started my first legal career, um, my first job in my legal career, um, I, I recall going to court and I recall walking to the courtrooms with my locks down to the middle of my back and seeing the, the, the responses from those in the, in the uh, one on, on, the, on the bench, one of the court staff, but also those just in the courtroom for my peers, um, wondering if I was lost, if I was in the right courtroom. And the pride I felt when finally my case was called and it was the council representing the city of San Diego and everyone looked around and I would stand up, I would walk up to, to, the, to the court, to the bench, across the bar, and they all had to stand there looking at my dreads down the middle of my back as I represented my client on behalf of the city of San Diego. Um, one of the things I took much pride in um, as I became more senior in my legal career was op opportunities to mentor new law students. I remember an instance where a young lady came to me had just started her twisting, her short haired phase, and she was worried that she was in her second year of law school and if she was gonna have to cut her hair in order to get a job. She was worried about the state of the economy, the state of the pressures to once again conform to what a perception is that um, we have to um, you know, agree, to, agree to do, agree to look like in order to move forward in, in a profession. And I was able um, to share with her my story. I was able to connect her to some other amazing um, women in the legal field that had a beautiful locks here in San Diego. And I was so proud because I didn't have that person um, early in my journey 
um, as part of my trials that I overcome one after the other, be able to share that with others is something um, that I was very proud of. And um, to see her to this day, she is now a practicing attorney and her locks are down to her shoulders. So um, it is one of those things with trials and triumphs. These are the small ones I, I, I continue to remember and, and share with others. But this evening, and I'm, I'm not sure if the, the host can share my link in the, in the um, chat box, but what I wanted to leave everyone with is, is something that maybe all of you know, but maybe some of you don't, but it is called the Crown Act. The Crown Act was drafted and sponsored by State Senator Holly Mitchell and was passed unanimously in both um, chambers of the California legislature in June, 2019, and was signed into law July 3rd, 2019. And the Crown Act stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And it's a law that prohibits race-based hair discrimination, which is denial of employment and educational opportunities because of hair texture or protective hairstyles, including braids, locks, twists, or bantu knots. So I leave that with you, and I hope you take an opportunity to, to click on, on the link shared in the, in the chat box, because this is passed in California, but has not been passed throughout all the United States. There's many groups that, would, that are in need of support. This is a message I think that continue to be shared, but I, I share this because all of us, I think our community know the trials that, that we've gone through um, with our appearance, with, with our hair, with um, the pressures to assimilate, to, to pursue our dreams. Um, but I'm so excited that in 2019, in, in the years of, of my career, that this legislation passed and it became law in 2019. And I just wanna share that with everyone that through all the trials, this is an amazing triumph for all of us. So thank you. Wow, I loved hearing about your hair and that connection with your mom. Um, I'm so glad you didn't cut your hair. <laughs> it's beautiful. So next up, we want to welcome Patricia. There, hi. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to celebrate Black women in American history. As we celebrate Black History Month, I invite us to acknowledge the contributions of Black women in our fight for a seat at the table and to have a viable leadership voice. First, we're going to recognize Black women as abolitionists. Later, we will examine the pivotal role that Black women occupied in the early voting rights and civil rights movement. Then, we will explore the cutting edge and powerful roles that we're playing at this time. However, we cannot have a conversation about Black women's roles in America without acknowledging the multiplicity of positions of intersectionality. Intersectionality takes into account a person's overlapping at identities and experiences in order to understand the complexities of prejudice we face. For example, we have to fight the fight against racism, in addition to sexism, then you add class, culture, sexual orientation, and gender identity. All of these are overlapping interdependent systems of racism. Dr. Sharon Presley, the executive director of the Association of the Libertarian Feminists and co-author of Exquisite Rebel, she gives a rundown of some of the many Black women who worked toward the abolition of slavery. There were far more women in the abolitionist movement than the heroic Tubman and Truth. Many Black women helped make the abolitionist movement a success. Dr. Presley, in our article, We Speak Their Names, Black Women Abolitionists, 
named a dozen black women abolitionists who we have not heard of, but who absolutely helped light the path to freedom. Black women as a whole were excluded from women's suffrage rights movement and their activities. Black female reformers understood that in addition to their gender, their race significantly affected their rights and available opportunities. White suffragists and their organizations ignored the challenges that African-American women faced. They chose not to integrate issues of race into their campaigns. The National American Women's Suffrage Association held conventions that excluded Black women. Black women were forced to march separately in the back of their parades. Ida B. Wells confronted suffragists who would not denounce lynching. She stated, white women, speaks, white women speak of rights, I speak of wrongs. In 1896, the newly formed National Association of Colored Women advocated for a wide range of reforms to improve life for African-Americans, including Jim Crow laws in the South that enforced segregation. Their motto was, lifting as we climb. Black women continued to fight until the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. By the way, I encourage us to look beyond the simplistic story of Rosa Parks refusing to move to the back of the bus. It was a rebellion of maids, a rebellion of working class women who were tired of boarding the buses in Montgomery and being assaulted and abused by the bus drivers. That's why the movement could hold so long because it went to the very, very heart of black womanhood. Black women powered the civil rights movement, but rarely became its leaders. Nevertheless, they were at the forefront and played a critical role. Some black women were empowered and thrilled by the black power movement, including the Black Panther Party. But most encountered its male chauvinism common to many nationalist movements at that time. Female activists sometimes did not find the intra, intra-racial cross-gender solidarity they sought. The roles played by men and women within the civil rights movement in reinforced the gender norms of the 60s. Bev Jackson, one of the chairpersons of the Democratic American Caucus stated, Black women have a special resilience. They have no safety net. So Black women just learn to walk the tightrope better. John Lewis stated, without the Black woman, there would be no NAACP. Part of my story is, after a prolonged illness, my father died in 1954 at the age of 44 as a result of unavailable health care for Black citizens in Arkansas. Although he was an independent landowner and an independent owner of a concrete business, by the time he died, it had all been sold, leaving my mother with 11 children and our status went from middle class to deep extreme poverty. Although in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education ruled that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional, schools in the South remain separate and unequal. Our only source of income was either domestic work or field work. I did both. As soon as my brothers turned 18, they escaped the cotton fields by joining the military and sending money home. My brothers made California home and convinced my mother 
that California was the land of opportunity. In 1965, my family was part of the great migration of millions of African Americans that left the South for what the author Isabel Wilkerson described as warmth of other sons. My mother proudly registered to vote for the first time in California in 1965. In the 56 years since my mother registered to vote and the 56 years since the Voting Rights Act, Black women have earned and insisted on a place in American politics. Now Black women are even more mobilized. Over the last several years and across America, Black women won elections in historic numbers from school boards to vice president. We are a voice against voter suppression, mass incarceration of Black men and women. We are advocates for equal health care, and we will continue to confront racial disparities in policing. And we will advance the cause for economic equality. Historically, Black women vote in extraordinary numbers, but we don't vote alone. We usher our families, our neighbors, our churches to the polls. Stacey Abrams noted, Black women are going to be at the forefront, not only giving rise to voter turnout, but also shaping the conversation. She continued, it has been a sea change in how vital our voices have been. She added, we're here like the Underground Railroad, but it has surfaced now in a big way. It's a rail train. My conclusion is we have a lot to be proud of, but we have much, much, much more work to do. Thank you for this opportunity. Impressive. Thank you so much, Patricia. So important to hear more about intersectionality. I think that that's such an important concept. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, and last, but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Joy Carter. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank the Diversity Coalition for uh, sponsoring this panel tonight. I've really enjoyed hearing from my, my colleagues. Um, this is why Black history should be uh, every day of the year, because we have melanin every day of the year. I'm very happy to be here. This happens to be the anniversary of my grandmother's birth. February 23rd is very important to me. And my grandmother is very important to my career. Um, my family all hails from Virginia, one of the uh, major slave trade uh, selling areas of the country. And my family is from a mixture of Native American and Black. And my grandmother uh, taught me the ways of Native American, as well as the notion that no one on earth is better than you and there's nothing you cannot do if you're trained for it. And I really embrace that concept. I am actually from Northeastern Ohio, a very small village called Wellsville, where we had a multicultural upbringing because that was the area where steel mills and brickyards and pottery were king back in the old days of the uh, 50s, 60s, and, and 70s. So I grew up with all kinds of people and everybody there talks like me. Uh, my family uh, relocated to Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, because during that time period in the early 1970s, Indiana refused to bus, and my mother was hired as a teacher. Uh, the federal government was insisting on separate and supposedly equal education. I started high school in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is also the home of Eli Lilly. And I had expressed an interest uh, to my guidance counselor as a freshman that I wanted to be a doctor. The guidance counselor immediately said, 
I would not make a good doctor. And I looked at him and I just said, you don't know anything about me. I walked out of the office and I ran into another guidance counselor named Mrs. Green. And I said, Mrs. Green, I was just told I couldn't become a doctor. And she said, oh no, baby. There's a program sponsored by Eli Lilly that has an immersion for students that want to learn about medicine. And she signed me up for the program. And I spent uh, my summer in between freshman and sophomore year in high school um, at the St. Vincent's Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. I was 14 and I wasn't doing a whole lot as far as medicine, but my job was to help prepare meals for the medical staff. This was a Catholic hospital. Uh, back then I wasn't into cooking, so I had a book in my pocket and I burned my hand on coffee and the workers asked me to step outside of the kitchen area and not to create any more harm. And they wouldn't tell anybody, just don't come back in. And so I'm out in the uh, hallway uh, reading my book and back in the old days in hospitals, the morgue where uh, decedents are stored and the kitchen area were in close proximity. I'm reading my book and I spy the sisters pushing a shrouded body into the morgue area. And I was very curious. And the sister said, no, this is horrible. You don't want to know. And I'm thinking I'm a teenager and I'm curious. I literally begged my way in um, to see what was going on. And I later begged my way in to see a postmortem because this was not a natural death. Um, I don't know what made that forensic pathologist allow me uh, to watch, but that day changed my entire life. I was already firm in my convictions on my belief um, that everybody is a person. And when death occurs, whatever has kept us alive moves because energy is never destroyed. It just moves or it changes, but you don't destroy it. And so I watched the postmortem at the age of 14. And by the end of the postmortem, I knew this exactly what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It was my calling, it was my passion um, to be able to tell how someone died was one thing. To be able to document their death um, was the second thing. But also to be able to help the family, which is what I also was privy to help the family through the most terrible time of, of their life. Um, and I was inspired. And when my mother picked me up from work that day, um, she was not inspired and she was very upset. Um, but I had received an equal dose of stubbornness from her, <laughs> my father and my grandmother. And I said, this is what I wanna do. And I was not afraid, I was intrigued. Um, I was able to change my job from the kitchen area to animal care at Indiana University a School of Medicine. Been an animal lover my entire life. And back in those days before PETA, they were doing research. And my job was to make sure they, the animals were, were cared for. And of course, I really cared for all of them. But I was able to read more about forensic pathology and I was so intrigued. I wrote to a doctor, um, and this was in the 70s, sight unseen. Um, his articles made sense to me and I wrote to him and said, I wanna be a forensic pathologist. Um, I wasn't sure he was going to answer me, but about three months later, I, I got a return letter and this is from Dr. Joe Davis, the late Dr. Joe Davis, who was, was the chief medical examiner of Miami, Florida. And he said, here are things that you must do. You must know the human body. You must know anatomy and, and physiology. Um, you also must have good communication skills. You must know how you feel about death. And that led to um, intermittent conversations through writing between the two of us through the rest of my high school career, college. And I met him when I was a first year medical student at Howard. Um, 
part of my journey uh, getting to forensic pathology was college after high school. And I went to Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. I earned a academic scholarship. Um, Wittenberg is very small, uh, private Lutheran um, college. And my mother dropped me off and I was looking forward to a great academic career. But the very first night of the first full week of school, uh, Wittenberg being 2% uh, black or less, uh, they held a savage tan contest in the cafeteria. In the cafeteria that I had to pay dues for student activities. We had a little group called Concerned Black Students and we got together. We all talked about what could we do with this savage tan contest at a primarily white institution where we were paying fees. They held this contest at the dinner hour. Um, the students and my group, we had our swimsuits underneath our clothes. So when they actually had the audacity to call up individuals to show off their tans, first for the guys, all the young black men stood up and went on stage and won the prizes. When they called for the women, the young black women, you could not beat our tans. We won the prize. And then we said, this will not happen again. You have no idea how arrogant, how disappointing, and frankly, how racist this behavior was. And we're not spending money on student government activities for this nonsense. That contest was canceled that night, never to recur again. I'm surprised that 40 years later, in fact, 2020, I received the Outstanding Alumni Award from Wittenberg University. My motto has always been, uh, I don't quit, I don't give up, and also that I'm not gonna be the last one. Uh, I was getting ready to uh, graduate from Wittenberg. I had made up my mind, I wanted to go to Howard University. I was going to continue in the theme of forensic pathology and I received an academic scholarship from the United States Air Force because we were in close proximity to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I did attend medical school as a um, military officer. And because I was in Washington, DC, where Howard's located, I was able to um, spend a lot of time working around the um, very active bases um, in the Washington DC area, Walter Reed, Andrews Air Force Base, Bowling. And I continued along the line of being a forensic pathologist um, to the point where my classmates actually nicknamed me Blood and Guts. I was always in the anatomy lab because I was intending to be a chief. I set my goal to be the chief medical examiner in Washington, DC, and I was not going to be deterred. And I knew I had to learn everything that I could. So I uh, finished medical school. I did an internship in, Washington, in, uh, in New York City, actually. Then I returned to Washington and did my residency in anatomical and clinical pathology learning how you make diagnosis of disease and evaluate treatment in the medical setting by looking at the body, doing biopsies, and of course using body fluids for testing. Uh, upon completing that, I then served um, in my fellowship year with my mentor, Dr. Joe Davis in Dade County, Florida, Miami. And that was the most wonderful year for me um, because I gained a lot of experience. I was their first um, black female fellow, uh, Dr. Davis, who insisted on uh, good communication skills, sent me all over the country to, to lecture about what I did and how I did it. Um, in uh, 1989, in fact, January 17th, 1989 was the last major riot in Miami. Um, and I was on duty that day when 
uh, case was sent in as a traffic accident. And that was not a traffic accident. It was a man who'd been shot while driving a motorcycle. And it was sent in as a traffic accident and almost overlooked. I spied a hole in the back of the helmet and sent the body for x-ray. And it was uh, death due to a gunshot wound, not a traffic accident. And I witnessed the burning of many areas of Miami over a week's time. And I remember writing my first article, which was called The Shame of Miami, because in that office, as their first Black uh, physician, um, many of the support staff in that office were African American and they lived in uh, places like Overtown and uh, Freedman's Village, which were Black neighborhoods. And yet the staff um, used euphemisms like Liberty City Natural. Uh, you know, Freedman Natural, but what they were referring to were homicides. And they continued to victimize individuals just because they lived in neighborhoods. Miami, like many cities, uh, can be very expensive. And not recognizing that your support and your help are individuals who by circumstance live in these neighborhoods, you think it's okay to say that because you're not, they're not saying it about yourself. So I pointed that out and I said, you know, you need to be aware of, of everybody as we're taught, uh, know who your community is. And I published that article in the National Medical Association Journal um, because this is something we all need to be aware of. Um, I guess I'm known for um, fighting for just cause. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's my calling. Um, being a medical examiner is a job where you determine how people die for different locales. Um, it can be a scary job for those who are not trained properly or don't know their feelings about death. But frankly, when you're able to tell how somebody has died, you actually weld a great amount of power and you have to be careful with that power. And some would say that, um, Perhaps it's not for a person of, of color. And I would say, why not? I'm gonna be the first and I'm going to uh, do it, do it well. Um, my upbringing was that underneath the skin, we are human beings. The only race that I really recognize is the human race. And the second race would have to be the Indianapolis 500. Other than that, I don't know what people are doing with these different uh, subjective terms. Um, being the first uh, chief medical examiner in this country has meant that I live up to what I always say, and that is I treat everybody with respect. I treat everybody as if um, they are worthy of respect because I'm a doctor and I took the oath to, to do so. It doesn't matter um, if your body's in pristine condition. It doesn't matter if uh, you've been homeless on the street doesn't matter if you've actually committed a crime or the victim of a crime. My, my duty and my pledge was to treat everybody the same and to be thorough in my examination of them. And that's what I've always done. Um, as I now celebrate my almost 39th year of medical practice, um, I've lived up to that my entire life. It's not a black or a white thing or a red thing. As a matter of fact, I would argue with you and everyone here tonight, there is no greater tool of diversity than death. No one escapes it. It doesn't respect your income, your gender identification, whatever vehicle you drive or neighborhood you live in. No one gets out of life alive. And that's one of my other mantras. So why not treat people like they are people? I worked in many cities around the country and lived all over the country. I was active duty in Washington, DC, and I did serve as the deputy chief of the armed forces medical examiner system. And I've lectured and traveled all over the world, which has afforded me even a greater observation that people are people and we really have the same basic desires. We want to clothe ourselves and our children, have enough food to eat, and have something to do. And that is the way that I have always lived my life. 
I returned home to Indianapolis in 2006, having been around the world uh, and away from that home for 31 years and to take care of my mother primarily. Um, and I, I, I wound up being the um, chief there and staying for 10 years and being absolutely too cold at times. Minus 20 is not when you need to get out and walk the dog. After I finished 10 years there, my mother had passed away. I took some time off and started traveling internationally and consulting, but just a little bit too much travel. And I decided to look for perhaps a warmer area. Um, and I ended up applying to several jobs in uh, California. And uh, I was on my way to another county north of here. And I was returning a call and by mistake, I contacted San Luis Obispo um, Sheriff Department and I said, I'm calling X County. And they said, oh, we're looking for somebody here. And uh, I said, well, I've been attending a, a virtual medicine conference annually in Santa Barbara for about five years. And I'll be coming out there for uh, the meeting in about two weeks. And this was actually in July of 2017. And they said, well, when you come to uh, Santa Barbara, just hop over the mountain, come meet us. And I did just that. It wasn't a hop. It was a horrible drive. I think it's 146. I haven't been on there since. But I uh, came up this way and I met with the sheriff and um, and the sheriff and toured the office and they took me to lunch in Avila Beach and they had whales out in the water. Uh, I was like, wow. And the sheriff said, you know, you can bring your dog to work. And I said, oh, all right, I'm here. And I ended up starting here um, in September of 2017. And here I am. I am their first full-time uh, forensic pathologist. Um, it's a job that uh, you do need to have experience since you are literally working solo. You need to be able to know what you're looking at, what you're recognizing. And it just so happens that I made it here just a few years before the onslaught of substance abuse hit as hard as it has this past year. Um, and you can see waves that they moved literally from the East Coast to the Midwest. And now we are here um, in, in San Luis Obispo. So um, I guess for 20 years, I was the only um, black chief medical examiner in the country. And I'm very proud to say one of my other mantras was, I might be the first, I won't be the last. And uh, I've seen some young people I've mentored from around the country and around the world move up in their respective areas. Uh, so we do have a um, black chief medical examiner in the state of Delaware. Uh, we just until two weeks ago had a black chief medical examiner in Washington DC and he's now become the chairman of pathology at Howard. Uh, we have uh, faculty members um, across the country um, but we don't have enough and we don't have enough because there are still many issues uh, that need to be considered with death investigation, um, neutrality, uh, honest testimony and representing that person no matter what their color is. And even today, some people would argue that a black person can't do that. And I argue back, we're people and we're intelligent and we can do what we're trained to do. So um, a little bit about me, I uh, am very happy to be here and I look forward to learning more from, from my colleagues. And by the way, I've been wearing my hair in Nashville since I was 11 years old and I have defied anyone to stop me, including the US Air Force. I just put it in a bun and I need to be comfortable and I am who I am and I'm a very proud black woman. Thank you. Wow, Joy, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I love your story. It's um, your perseverance is incredibly inspiring. 
So now for some Q and A. Um, if the audience has any questions, uh, go ahead and submit them in the Q and A box, and we'll get to that. So let's see what we've got here. So the first question is: Last week on February seventeenth, the House held a hearing for HR forty, a bill to form a commission to study reparations as a tool for race, racial redress, equity, and justice. Biden supports this. Any thoughts or comments? Does anybody want to take a stab at that? <laughs> I, I mean, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling if that's okay. And let me just, yeah. can I just say, um, oh my gosh, Oh, you know, I, I know of, have been connected with and had the chance to interact with Joy and Charles and Patricia over the years, but, you know, rarely do we have a chance to actually sit down and learn about each other, from each other, with each other. So I am super, super grateful for them and sharing what they shared. And Joy, my niece is a first year student at Howard. I got like tons of cousins that are, are Bison alums. So we'll talk about that later, but still, thank you all. And um, this is the longest my hair has been. I've worn it natural since I was, you know, a teenager, but um, my, my mother would always get on my case about cutting my hair. Why don't, don't cut, don't cut that hair I gave you, right? And when she passed away in January, I had just gotten a haircut the week before she passed away. And I don't think, you know, I just, I can't cut my hair now because I know she'll smite me. She will come and get me. <laughs> Anyways, um, back to the question though. Um, I think part of, and I'm, you know, I'm not an attorney, so I, I'm hopefully I won't say anything inappropriate from a legal standpoint in terms of the way legislation works. But I really feel like one of the most important things about reparations is honoring the legacy of the lives and loss of identity, and um, you know, the, just the control and the and the villainy <laughs> of white people. <laughs> so, and um, my on my mother's side in Florida, a lot of our family were from Micanopy, which is a lot of the land that Disney owns. And they, the Disney Corporation stole that land from so many people, black and brown and indigenous folks, you know, um, and everybody loves to go to, you know, the, the Magic Kingdom and the world, of, you know, all the different parks and theme parks over there, not realizing just how many people are dispossessed or disenfranchised for the sake of moving that company forward, right? And so whether it's in the, you know, removal of, of st statues and symbols of the Confederacy, which, you know, even by the way, those things weren't erected back in the 1800s. They were erected more contemporarily as defiance against civil rights, right? So we need reparations. I'm glad that President Biden is supportive of that bill and I look forward to learning more about it. Um, and I'll piggyback off of, of that. Just, I, I, again, as, as an attorney, I always know you don't speak on things that you don't have hands-on experience so with the drafting and everything that went into the legislation. I can't speak to that, but I can speak to what I would say is, is kind of a, um, a landmark or, or if that's truly gonna gain traction is what we saw recently with Proposition um, 16 here in California. And that is bring diversity back as a factor into public employment education and contracting. And if we're still here in California of all states, um, still grappling with that approach to, to bringing back that, that aspect and just, to, and just to so many facets of our community, then I think just on a national level, there's definitely more conversations and, and things to unpack um, before that, that might actually get the traction that um, the new administration is seeking. I'd like to uh, weigh in on that as well. Uh, I just found out about a situation that occurred in 1919 in Eileen, Arkansas, which was approximately 60 miles from where I grew up, that a group of sharecroppers tried to unionize. And uh, while they were in the church, the church was shot up, burned, and hundreds of Black people lost their lands and homes. The implications are still there. It's not very convoluted. It's pretty simple that the ripple effect is still impacting people in that city of Arkansas that are still living below the poverty line. What do we do with that? 
with the fact that these people, while their houses were being burned and they were being hung, they were uh, taking possession of their land. Those things have to be addressed. And, and the descendants are still living there. Um, I would like just to say that I'm hoping that this comes to fruition and certainly in the form of improving quality of life for uh, Black people in, in this country. I, I think that this past year has shown the divide in access to medical care, um, the uh, continued fear of the general medical behavior towards people of color, brown and Black. Uh, the unequal housing, the continued unfair housing practices as far as the not selling to people in certain areas and the unequal um, educational system, which is, has become based on income. And I am hoping that some funds will be used to one, include black people in history. We are woven into the fabric of, of this country and I hope that we can have historians add truthful stories into the history and get rid of some of these nonsensical things like everybody had a great time at Thanksgiving. Um, you know, that's, I'm, and I'm hoping that we can build a decent housing uh, where the communities have access to fresh air and uh, physical exercise and that we can somehow provide better nourishment in inner city areas. We have a lot of cities that have food deserts. And we all know that some of our uh, unhealthy food is much cheaper than uh, fruit and, and salad. So I'm hoping that they'll take a, a look uh, at how we can really um, provide for individuals who because of their color are left out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's all that's so important. Thank you. Every, everybody had a good answer. <laughs> um, I, we have one, one question in the chat from Preston Allen. He says, what has surprised you about your journey? Um, does anybody want to start that I ended off? up in San Luis Obispo. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's funny, but it's actually, it's true. I've been, I, like I said it in my comments. Um, I thought I was going to you know, live all my life in the city of Boston. And so, but what's mostly surprised me is the potential and to, to Dr. Carter's point, like we're all humans. And when we just kind of start with the basic premise of respect and civility towards each other, you can actually get stuff done. If, if when folks are able to peel back the layers and let go of all their assumptions and their perspectives of I'm better than you because I'm black or white or male or female or straight or gay. That's not what makes you necessarily better or worse than somebody. It's by your actions and your learning and how you lead your life and not necessarily how you happen to be born into a certain aspect of an identity or grow into an identity. I think the thing that has surprised me is the black tax that continues and and it's, it's a factor of the cost for not, quote, assimilating, uh, the cost of um, code switching, having to be hypervigilant in this time, in this day, in this uh, environment. It is uh, a level of stress when people still see you and, and you're going downtown slow and you walk into a store and you're still a target. I remember Michelle Obama said when she was incognito, she was uh, stopped in stores by security. So I don't think I expected that to continue so blatantly to the degree that it has. And I, I'm just concerned about the fact that we're still having to be hypervigilant. I remember when I called the police to my house uh, a couple of years ago, and um, my husband was out of town, and I asked the dispatcher to please tell the officers that I am African-American, I'm the homeowner, 
And she kind of laughed. And I said, no, please tell them that because Louis Gates got arrested in his own home. And so that part of hypervigilance is still a factor for me. I would say for, for my journey, um, what I'm so surprised is, is with how I know so many amazing people have come before me and changed history, but yet there's still this perception that is, that is just by my very existence is challenged every day. Yes. And, and, and that is what I'm still amazed with along my journey. Um, you know, I meant to say during my, my story is one of the, the most common questions I, I used to receive and not as much as often, but people would ask me, what do you do with your hair when you go to court? I was like, and I was like, oh, I'll just leave it in the car. And then, and then it would hit them about the question Davis asked me and that, that I couldn't function as an attorney. I couldn't function in my profession with my hair. I would have to somehow disconnect it from my being in order to, to flow through this world, through, through this society. So um, that is something I'm still surprised with on this journey. One of the things I do love with this journey is seeing little kids, uh, children. And, and as I walk through this new city as the city attorney, um, family saying, hey, this is, this is the new city attorney and seeing the kids' faces and then processing like, oh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. So um, that's something I still ch feel challenged with on my journey, but I, I love every day of it. And I'm sorry, I meant to do, which I meant to do when I finished up with my presentation on the Crown Act. Is <laughs> yeah. The Crown back for everybody. Thank you. Um, well, I, I wish I could say I had some surprises. <laughs> um, but I have to tell you, I, I was just devastated by the political scene that occurred and by the obvious uh, difference in the way people of color and white people were treated. As a military officer, I was disgusted by the siege of the Capitol building and the fact that they walked out instead of being put into paddy wagons. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know when that's, that is never going to settle with me. And in terms of all the accusations of violence and things going on with Black Lives Matter this past summer. No, this country has a problem and you just can't cover it up and act like it never happened. Not my journey, my yeah. observation. Can, can I add to the dollars a follow on to that? And it's that the, the, and it's not up to the black people to do that. You know, white people have to right. have to deal with their hate their rage, their ignorance, their fears, their guilt, whatever the hell that, excuse me, whatever the heck they have going on, right? And right. that may help us get a little bit of some traction towards sustainable change. I love your crown, by the way, Charles, it's awesome. Um, and so, yeah, just what Dr. Carter was saying really made me think back to this new documentary that just was released about healing from hate and how people have infiltrated some of these white supremacist groups and you know, a lot of that bravado and that thing we saw in that insurrection was just a blatant example of years and years and years and years of unrequited, unchallenged, unfettered hate and ignorance, reinforced and still sustained by people who, who say they know better, a bunch of hypocrites. I'm gonna stop there. Right, yeah. I, I'm just shocked at the lack of accountability from the top. It appears that it has been dismissed and they're tracking a few here and a few there, but we don't see the systemic part of it saying this is unacceptable. I don't hear the outrage from people that may have supported certain candidates at that time, but still saying this is not okay. And it didn't move the needle a whole lot either. We didn't see a major shift in the views and the outrage. Yeah. So the next question is from Nancy and she says, a common thread with all the panelists stories was mentoring. Uh, do you feel enough people in society today spend time mentoring others? No, 
No, that they don't. We, we, we need more mentors. We have to stop the attitude that I pulled myself up. You do the same. We have to reach back. I personally mentor about 10 students a month all over the world. Um, I want them to succeed. I want them to hear from me um, the ups and downs, the ins and outs of, of my profession because they have to come behind me. You know, you have to bring somebody with you and it doesn't hurt you to share um, some, some tidbits. If the gentleman hadn't helped me, again, sight unseen, I, I don't know that I would have been in, in this career or, or been successful, but yeah, we do have to, to mentor, particularly in today's times. Mentoring is a good thing. And this idea that people get what they get or get where they get without the help of others is just one more of those fallacies out there, right? Um, and, and it's not just one mentor. I think people need multiple mentors because you find different mentors provide you with different things that you, that, need, that you need over the course of your life, personal or professional. So yes, we all need to mentor and we need to have mentors. And I, I would agree, I would say mentoring and, and being mentored is, is one of my passions and one of the things I've really committed myself to. And I could say um, from Dr. Morton to some of the panelists on this event um, are mentors in my life, with, which I cherish. Um, and I think, I think what, I, what I've realized um, as I spoke to more people about this is we really overcomplicate the concept of mentoring. We really feel, feel it has to have all these boxes to check, all these requirements, when it really at the foundation of it is just relationship with two people along this journey in life. And if you could keep it simple, um, you could find so many amazing relationships um, to, to mentor others and also be mentored and mentor your peers. So I definitely think that it's something we should revisit. Um, I have to talk to anyone about it, but um, yeah, I think mentoring is something that's lacking and um, can be a simple addition to, to your everyday routine. Trisha, you have something to add or do you want me to ask you the next question? <laughs> As a first generation high school student, my mom told us we had to go to college. However, we didn't know how, we didn't know about uh, programs and opportunities. So when I became an administrator at Cal State University, San Bernardino, we formed an allegiance with black faculty and staff and we all adopted a first generation college student and made sure if it took them four, five, six years to get them through because of the dropout rate. So that was uh, a really a pivotal time for the students coming into Cal State San Bernardino. That's so Patricia, cool. something, so, sorry, something Patricia said just made me think of this tool piece about mentoring, especially, I don't know who all's in the audience, but I know a lot of my mentors aren't, aren't black, right? They're, they're white and they're, many of them are men. Um, they're all different kinds of shapes and sizes and persuasions. But what I think made the essence of mentoring good is they, in the relationship building piece is they didn't try to change me to be someone I'm not. They helped me grow to be the person I was meant to grow to be. And so those in the audience who want to be or consider themselves allies, just know that your role as a mentor, especially to someone that's uh, from a historically underrepresented group or as a target for some form of discrimination, negative prejudice, is to start by believing them. Don't explain it away. Racism exists, it's a thing. Sexism exists, it's a thing. These things intersect with each other. And it's not about a person just putting on a braver face or turning another cheek. We run, you know, no. Right. So start by believing, do your own work and acknowledge your points of privilege so that you can help other people grow into their greatness. Awesome. OK, so the next question is from Vi Pierce. She says, did ethnic studies play a factor in your education and lives? No, Camille. Um, go ahead. I'll just let Dr. Yeah. Dr. Carter go first. You know, I, I mentioned my grandmother, I, I, and I must mention my, my mother, who always said, read more than one source, always had Ebony Jet uh, magazine, and I wrote about this story, but in the fifth grade, as the only child of color in my class, my fifth grade teacher introduced 
world history and the study of Africa by pointing to me and saying I could stay out in the sun longer, which embarrassed me initially as a fifth grader. Uh, and for about 30 seconds, I was speechless. And then it popped into my head that um, they had an article in Ebony Magazine about um, research on skin cancer and the protective nature of melanin. And so I stood up from my chair and I gave her a little piece of my mind. And um, I said, yes, I can stay out in the sun. I said, you know, my melanin is protective. And I ended up with saying, um, and we don't age the same way. You're probably the same age as my mother and my mother looks better than you. And I escorted my own self to the principal's office and I called my mom and told her what happened. And she, she left her classroom, sped like something and got down to my school. And she walked in and she gave a lecture on slavery and the conditions of the slave ship. And this is before black studies. And that was a day that, I, you know, I, I said, never again, this will not happen again. I will never be silent. I will never hang my head. You will never make me ashamed of my blackness. And that was my fifth grade change of life. <laughs> Powerful. I could say from my experience, um, having obtained my ethnic studies minor from Cal Poly, um, it definitely influenced uh, my journey, but I don't think in a way that many would think, because at Cal Poly, being an ethnic studies minor, I was often the only African-American student in my class <laughs> while talking about um, very interesting, very, very, I would say, not dis discussions weren't interesting. The responses that were shared from my classmates during discussions were interesting. Now, I would share this with, with a sense of one instance in which I had a professor um, explaining to the class that the difference in Irish immigrants' ability to assimilate into American culture, where the African American um, freed slaves, or African freed slaves weren't able to do, was based upon strategy, implementing a strategy to work their way into society which uh, was not utilized by uh, the freed slaves, to which time I stood up in class. But, but those experiences, I would say, um, with ethnic studies and receiving it in, in um, certain environments or in the environment I did, um, definitely impacted my journey into understanding the kind of thoughts and questions that are still out there that I was being faced with on the campus of higher education. Well, I imagine um, the few that even had the privilege to, to be in that classroom. So that, that was definitely my experience and, and how it influenced me going forward. Yeah, we didn't, I mean, we didn't have ethnic studies in its current form or in any, any disciplines ever evolving and changing. But I think I, I, if I, I shared the story about my eighth grade history, American history teacher. Um, and I think that was my first forward for, for journey into learning the essence of a people's existence or the history um, outside of the, the traditional canon, right? But also I feel like I got a lot of ethnic studies through my extended family and the way in which I watched my mother, you know, be a mama bear when, uh, you know, I was getting bullied by some kids in fourth grade and I stood up for myself. And then this is when a teacher, our school was predominantly black and my fourth grade teacher was like, you know, we're just gonna place gin, rummy and Scrabble because you all don't really wanna learn. And that's what we did all day, every day in fourth grade. I am a whiz at Scrabble and I will play a mean card game, but I still cannot subtract and add fractions that well, right? So you think about the things that you need to get in certain grades and this teacher, white woman, Mrs. Hackle, and she took a bunch of us on a field trip to the circus, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but the, my mom, you know, I, I stood up to this guy and cussed him out using a few choice words <laughs> and um, I was sent to the principal's office and my mother came down and she cussed him out, she cussed the teacher out, she cussed everybody out. You know, so this idea of like uh, um, standing up for yourself, understanding, you know, that you do have the right to be respected. And I don't, you know, I'm not an ethnic studies scholar and I know ethnic studies is much more complicated than that, but it's sort of, an, uh, it's a cousin of sociology. And it's seeing how, you know, individuals when they come together in groups and build their societies or their cultures 
how whose voices are privileged and whose voices are not how do we create meaning as we interact with each other and in the process of creating that meaning how we set up hierarchies or 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 create opportunities for inclusion and uh, history and sociology and all those things kind of meld together to help us get there so while not formally connected um with ethnic studies i do feel i benefited from it especially as now my later in my career with the colleagues i get to collaborate with and co-teach and co-research with uh, from ethnic studies at cal poly all right so next uh ten strand says um or asks what recommendations can you offer for addressing the inequities in stem education for students of color should we have more doctors and scientists to address critical issues facing our communities? We can um, skip there, it too, if you want. No, <laughs> Whatever I, I, you guys want to do. <laughs> there, is, there is no doubt um, that our young people need to be exposed. One, uh, proper history to know the legacy that's been kept from them, the, the secret of all the things Black people have done in the world of science and medicine, engineering. Uh, one, tell the story. Two, expose the students of those that are there. And those who are there, make yourself available to those students so that they can see you and see that you're real and your flesh and blood, and this is your story, and this is your pathway. I think it goes along with uh, mentoring. I've been involved with STEM for a long time. And uh, if I could add too, it's not just telling uh, the story and helping the students of color in STEM understand and find their path and journey, and so it's the, the students who aren't persons of color and their faculty, right? It's, it's you've got to look at the whole system. And so people that are, in the journey towards a degree, the people that have degrees in their professions, because you can un, you can undo a whole lot of good by virtue of you know great mentoring and opportunities, and you put a student into a situation where they are faced with somebody that is not as enlightened or in, engaged in developing their own anti-racist sensitivities, and it, that's why this it keeps perpetuating. I mean, we, I left Cal Poly because it was just, you know, I left for a year because I was just overwhelmed. I was taxed, I was exhausted. They wore me down. And that's even with a lot of really good mentors and things that were there to lift me up. I had just had it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we'd see a similar kind of situation now in a lot of our emerging professionals that are, they're just exhausted. So this, I'm gonna call out the white people. Sorry, y'all out there, white folks, um, you know, do your homework and, uh, Get, get what get with the program <laughs> and we'll do the same you know us black and brown folks we'll do the same and hopefully we can find a better destination on our way and and i would add definitely building off dr carter's statement is an understanding of, of history of world history as we know history is written by the victor and oftentimes it's wiped out things that is well established oftentimes growing up and even this day it seems like all knowledge started with the greeks that's what everyone says but who did the Greeks learn from? And, and we know the answer to that, as well as who brought algebra and sciences to, to Europe? Do we talk about the Moors? So these, this kind of history, which really kind of ties into what Dr. Bryant was speaking of, it says at one point there was a push for considering diversity in curriculum. And, and when I was a student at Cal Poly, as far as the student government, I participated in a committee with faculty and staff trying to address that. And, and I'm sharing the story because I understand the exhaustion that the BFSA as well as other faculty and staff faced as I sat in this committee meeting talking about diversity in the curriculum and a professor stated, what am I gonna teach about diversity? Am I gonna teach about basketball? And at that point, I sat back, I looked around and it hit me to understand what these other professors, these mentors that I often went to, what they were dealing with that as a students had no clue the kind of systemic issues in inside an organization of higher learning, which is what's in control of really form formative years of these young minds. But if those struggles with that issue was happening there, then what was the true sense that it was gonna to progress to actually getting diversity in the curriculum to teach a true robust history and not just in certain majors such as ethnic studies or other history, but through all curriculum. So 
that's that's definitely something I think um, we should build on and, and consider. And I and I think also letting kids know about Nesby and all the amazing student organizations that exist. Um, so it's not one older generation. I'm sorry, more senior and wit and wise generation teaching um, youth, but youth teaching youth too, and and us connecting that chain of generations. And I think that'd be very helpful for all of us. So um, the next question is from Courtney Hale, and she asks, what do you do for self-care? You got shot. <laughs> I, I'm a big, big believer in self-care. Uh, I don't do it just once a week. I do it every day. I have to renew myself so I can face the challenges of my job every day. Uh, yes, I take my dog to work. That's my first self-care. I can pull out my dog for a little hug therapy and then I let him to the rest of the office. Um, I actually, what I really enjoy about being here at San Luis Obispo is that I need a daily walk and my walk in the morning is called a walk for normalcy. And I would rather come in with nature than anybody else. A cup of coffee and a walk. And, um, you have, I have to be able to renew myself so that I can get up and do it the next day. And I always tell people, find something to do other than your job, whether it is <laughs> talking to somebody, I do my plants, um, but I have to vacate my mind. And so yeah, every day, self-care. I have a very supportive group of women that uh, have my best interests at heart. I have been able to eliminate a few toxic people from my lives gently but firmly and set good boundaries. And before the pandemic, uh, I always included, included the walks and a massage in my budget. You know, maybe I wouldn't go out to eat that week, but I made certain that I got a massage. And Courtney, I know that you are a master teacher and I have found some of those as well. But I work on that balance. Sometimes I have to say no to good things that people ask me to do and say, no, I need less face time. Sometimes I realize I have too much face time with other people that are trying to get their needs met through me. And so I need to pull back and say, no. And that works. Saying no is major self-care. And sometimes I just say that won't work for me. Not now. Ask me again next year to sit on that board. So I have all these uh, bumper sticker pl platitudes to take care of myself. Definitely. The, um, just taking a moment to just be grateful to be able to breathe. You know, and even in Zoom meetings with different groups of men, we're getting into the practice of starting meetings with moments just to take like one or two minutes of breathing and clearing our minds and settling in and letting go of the other 6,000 emails and text messages and everything that followed us into that meeting. Um, so I think that that's an important part of my self care. I'm an avid knitter, so I've been picking up my knitting again. Um, I used, you know, Walking is great, but in some ways it's harder now working from home, like being on campus, I could take sometimes a long way around to get somewhere just to clear my mind and stretch my legs and, you know, because you don't have to go out and walk for an hour, an hour and a half, even just, you know, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, spaced throughout the day makes can make a huge difference in mm -hmm. um, a person's health and well-being, laughter, and just, you know, trying to be in community with people, family and friends, and I talk to my mom every day and my dad, and sometimes, especially, I will call on my aunties and uncles um, when I just kind of need a chance to kind of get some perspective. <laughs> the ancestors are Our here. Ancestors, they are here. They don't go away. God love them. Yeah, awesome. I love that. That's so uplifting. <laughs> you all had good answers. Um, so uh, the last, I think we're getting close on time. So I'll just give this last one. Gina in um, AG says, what do you think that can be done at Cal Poly to improve the situations around racism and hate crimes? 
And she's referring to the shredder in New Times last week. The, is the situation ever going to improve? That's, that's a question. Um, I think I referred to this earlier today, like until it's, it's, there's not any one thing someone can do individually or that a group can do collectively to stop people from being ignorant or from engaging in hateful behavior, hate expression. Um, we, yeah, we can try to eradicate it, maybe minimize it, but uh, Cal Poly is a part of society and it's an institution that was born out of a system of racism and sexism and other isms, anti-Semitism and more. And so you see the manifestation of those patterns of systemic oppression manifesting themselves in different way. Charles gave a great example from his experience when he was a student, when you know faculty was, were working really hard to sort of bring the curriculum into the 21st century and the level of ignorance, even amongst educated people or people that consider themselves educated is deeply rooted in bias, implicit and explicit based on misinformation and fear and, and, and all kinds of other things. So, you know, I, um, you know, and I'm, I, as an administrator at Cal Poly, I, I don't ever shy away from telling people how I really feel. And I know, I think there's some people here that get the chance to work with me, or I have the chance to work with them. And I think one of our biggest uh, shortfalls at Cal Poly is outwardly facing, not acknowledging consistently the, that we are inherently racist as an institution. And racism and sexism and all those other things do exist, uh, but uh, we have not claimed it and we're not willing or able yet to do the types of reparations we need to start doing. Um, and, 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 and as you start doing that, there will be backlash, right? I don't know who was the perpetrators of the um, painting of the swastikas and other things at um, Alpha Epsilon Pi uh, a few weeks ago, whether they were people from Cal Poly or not, in some ways it doesn't matter. It's like people uh, there are people out there that hate other people just because of something about who they are, right? And it's not, you just, education might help change that. Holding people accountable when they are caught in terms of, you know, doing those kind of heinous crimes or, or acts could help that. But um, I don't think there's any one thing alone that's going to make it better. Uh, and I, I say, I hate to sound so defeatist. And I would add too, I remember after the Crops House incident, um, David Kahn, God rest his soul, what a gift to humanity he was. Um, you know, he and Cornell at the time were co-chairs of what we called University Diversity Enhancement Council. I think that's what it was, Cornell, or maybe it was QCIT, the Community Committee on University Citizenship. I'm not sure what it was called, but they, as administrators, brought that community together, created space for faculty, staff, and students to process through the um, the hurt and the frustration, not just of the crop sales, but also the cross burning in the Royal Grande. And during that time, it's like students, faculty, staff, we're all saying, it's like, we need to understand and un who we are as individuals and why we will let that sexist joke slide when we're with our friends, you know? And if you can't combat ignorance and hate in a social setting with your peers, how in the world are you gonna do it in a more public setting, right? I know we, you know, yes, we have a lot of good movement in Black Lives Matter and, um, protests and civil disobedience, right? But we, we just have to, it has to happen on all these different levels, right? Mm -hmm. Education of all the people across the whole spectrum of life and um, affirmations and reparations and holding people accountable and building it in, institutionalizing. This is an expectation of inclusion and equity and social justice. That's the norm, not the other stuff. Thank you. I, I would uh, hop in and, and close with this in that when what, what I've experienced in my time at Cal Poly and then helping found the Cal Poly Black Alumni chapter and staying tied to the community and, and the students is I've honestly lost count of how many surveys on the current climate, climate, uh, current campus climate and culture the school has done. Um, one thing um, during my award speech in which I had the chance to speak with the president there and, and everyone in the audience, I want to make it clear to the community that is often used and said, what we're seeking as, as those on that campus is 
progress, not perfection. And I feel that oftentimes community is stuck in a position, well, until there's a perfect answer, until there's a perfect way, until we can ensure that the outcome is going to be exactly what we want, we're stuck in, in neutral. We're not making progress. And all, all the community is asking, all anyone's asking in society is just an effort to advance each day in, in, in the right direction. Each year, see that we've made progress. And, and I think that is, that is something that could really help change um, and give some hope um, for change on the Cal Poly campus and in the outlying San Luis Obispo community. Thanks. Okay. I'm glad you said that, Charles, because it's not just about Cal Poly. It's the, it's the city and the county, you know, of which Cal Poly is a part of. Thank you for that. Okay. At this point, I'm going to ask Cornell to come back on and close us out for the evening. Thank you so much to all the panelists. You all were so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you for, uh, for an excellent moder uh, uh, moderation there or role as moderator. Thank you so much for that. I want to oh, look at Charles acting up over there with crown. My goodness. <laughs> Well, you, you just, man, I, I got to find some of that stuff. I can't do anything except this blank wall here. Um, let me just say this, um, and I'm not going to be too long winded. My colleagues uh, tease me about that occasionally. But I tell you, I could spend all night um, singing your praises. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your courage. Underline the word courage. Uh, which is a manifestation of a willingness to speak truth to power, to share stories that are digested sometimes easily by some and not so easily by others, but stories that need to be told. And thank you for sharing your histories. You know, we come to these positions of, uh, I'll call them uh, uh, success, uh, or uh, standing in our community through all sorts of travels that have been, as our theme more than implies, trials and triumphs. And you've shared those tonight. I truly, truly appreciate that. I took so many notes. I ran out of paper. Just, just, just for me, you know, I'm, I, I, I was a student tonight. And thank you for that as well, for helping all of us learn more. And I just wanna say, um, as we move forward, um, we are, as has been mentioned, um, we are progressing, but we're not perfect. And there's a whole lot of work to be done. And I think at the same time, uh, none of this work gets done without the likes of folks like you. And, and so in your respective areas of endeavor, your respective social circles and professional circles, uh, you stand tall and you represent a legacy, a royal legacy of resistance, a, a royal legacy of accomplishment as we talk about standing on the shoulders of others. We've heard that phrase so many times and it is so very real. And so tonight, um, my goodness, I, I, I could just go on. But I, I just want to thank you so much. And the chat, you know, the chat roster is just full of compliments and praise for your work and for all that you do to make this community better, no, ever, no matter where we are. In, uh, Southern California, Charles, or up here on the Central Coast. Um, thank you so much. I want to um, remind those who are still with us that we do have uh, coming up later uh, in the year uh, programs related to our continued interest in fostering understanding in this community. Uh, on March 25th, uh, 6 p.m., Dr. Justin Frank will talk about uh, what he calls uh, how we might unite, a psychological perspective, which is kind of interesting. Written several books um, as a psychologist, uh, three books, uh, Trump on the couch, Bush on the couch, Obama on the couch. Now that's kind of interesting. 
just to think about that. And then on March, I'm sorry, May 6, uh, Dr. James Armstead and Victor Conde, uh, the theme there, human rights law, a yardstick for US law and policy. Uh, that's one that you might even be interested in as well, Charles, and all the rest of us uh, thinking about how law impacts uh, our work and this world and this country, especially. So with that said, um, <laughs> y'all are the bomb. <laughs> and, uh, it was an honor. It was, it was, it was wonderful. And uh, I just want to thank you so much. And I guess I'll end it with that. And on behalf of the entire coalition, thank you as well to those who tuned in tonight. We had good numbers tonight and we uh, were able to sustain that crowd. And I really appreciate that. And again, thanks to Kendra and thanks to Michael, Kendra Paulding, Michael Boyer, uh, others who have helped us to make this program possible. You all have a good night and uh, Thank you. Peace Thank you all. This is amazing. Peace it was an you. honor. It was truly an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.